on holiday. The trees have to be pruned, we have to maintain them against pests and diseases, regulate the amount of fruit on the, on the tree, and uh, we are in the hands of the heavens should we have hail or frosts or bad pollination. And what happens to the apples that don't make the grade? Did they just get thrown away? Oh no, most certainly not. We um, developed a few years ago um, something that you're probably going to appreciate and enjoy at this moment. I'm going to let you try some of the apple juice. I've got some russet juice here, Jamie, which I'd like you to try. Try that and see, see what you think of that. Okay, cheers. Very sweet. This is made from Cox's orange pippins. A little bit drier than that one. And finally, we've got the Bramley juice. Oh, lovely. Bottoms up. Cheers. Mm. Well, I'm going to be making an apple crumble with Michael. And which apple do you think would be best for making it with? Only one choice. That's the Bramley, famous for its pies, crumbles, etc. Let's go and get some. Excellent. I'm here at Piper's Farm near Columpton, where they produce quality beef. So let's go meet the bullocks and the man who looks after them. They're Red Ruby cattle. These are the native Exmoor beef breed. So they've been around in Devon for hundreds of years and the reason that they were developed here is because they're perfect for surviving up on Exmoor and then we bring the young bullocks off the moor down to the lowland valley pastures of the Calm Valley here and they thrive off grass. I know that eating healthily is good for our life and well-being, but is it for bullocks as well? Absolutely. For cattle and sheep, mostly their diet is grass. So the grass they eat is absolutely vital. The deep rooting grasses pull up all the minerals and vitamins that these animals need. There's no going down to the chemist to get supplements for these cattle because this food for them, it's like meat and two veg. It's a wonderful balanced diet. Well, you know what they say, what goes in one end has to come out the other. And for cow farmers, that means cow pats. Because this farm doesn't pump their animals full of chemicals, that means the cow pats here are a whole ecosystem in themselves. You can see that the surface of this cow pat not only are the remnants of little bits of the cow's meal from yesterday, bits of clover, little bits of grass and barley, but it's also riddled with holes. And that's from all the insect life that's burrowing in here and eating it. There's a little beetle here. And if we just break the surface open, ooh, a good job you haven't got smell of vision you can see that underneath it's absolutely crawling with life these little tiny dung beetles are in there eating the organic material from the cow pat and because there's no chemicals in this cow pat they're free to live and breed on the farm there's only so much fun you can have with a cow pat and i think i've got the most out of that one Oh, that's disgusting. Okay, Peter, how do these bullets get from here to our plates? Well, that's a very good question, and it's very important to us that we make it as stress-free for these animals as possible. They're very chilled out while they're in the field. We then take them ourselves to a small abattoir about 20 minutes away from here. In fact, the abattoir is in somebody's farmyard. So they go there, they're killed with minimum stress. And then we bring the carcass, split into quarters, back here to the farm. And if you like, I can take you down and we'll have a look at the, the cutting room where we process it. This is the hind quarter and we use each piece of the carcass for different purposes. The shin comes off by the back leg here, and that's done lots of work, so it has lots of gristle in, perfect for making a, a stew, long, slow cook. And the top side of beef for a good Sunday roast, and the rump steak comes from here, just in front of the tail, which would be on there. And here's the sirloin, running all the way down the back, and in under the sirloin, the fillet steak sits in there, does no work at all, so it's incredibly tender. 
Here's the rib, which makes a very good old-fashioned roast. Ribs of beef on the bone. And here you see the marbling, which with really good beef produced the way we're doing it, is a very important part of the flavor and the eating sensation. These little flecks of fat that have come from eating that wonderful grass and the hay that we looked at in the field. Okay, so me and Mike are making burgers. What cut of meat will we need to use for that? Well, as you can see, Tubbs is breaking up the forequarter here. Each muscle comes away individually. Here's, for example, some very good pieces. Some of the character, bits of fat, you need a bit of fat in there, you need some of the light gristle. So these mussels which have come out of the forequarter would be excellent for making the mince. Well, it looks so much different to the mince I see in the supermarket. Well, it will be, Jordan. One of the main reasons is because it's been hung for so long, there's simply no water in it. So it's got that wonderfully rich depth of flavour. And it certainly will make fantastic burgers. You'll taste the difference when you come to eat them. Look, guys, I don't know about you, but looking at that beef this morning made me wonder why we don't use local produce all the time. I agree. I mean, it's not just beef, cheese or apples. We need to think about what we consume every day. Let's cook. Bum.